right. Um, hello and welcome to our Hooray for Gay YA panel presented by Underlined. Uh, my name is Rachel Strolley. I am a books contributor for BuzzFeed as well as a teen librarian and I do a bunch of stuff for book festivals as well. I'm so excited today to be with these four incredible authors to talk about their amazing books. Um, I'm going to have them all introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their most recent or newly upcoming releases. Um, August, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I am A. R. Petta. That's what I publish under. You can call me August. Um, my new book is Rebel Robin, which is a Stranger Things novel about the queer nerd icon Rebel uh, Robin Buckley. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that's that's about that. Awesome, uh, Trun. Hi, uh, my name is Trung Ling Nguyen, and my debut graphic novel is The Magic Fish. It came out in October, and it is a story about coming out across language barriers and using the language of stories and fairy tales to facilitate um, the uh, different language and cultural barriers. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of pretty pictures in there, and um, graphic storytelling is a huge passion of mine, so I'm really excited for people to be able to see and read it. Wonderful. Uh, Victoria? Hey, I'm Victoria. I'm the author of The Fever King and the Electric Air. And then my next book is A Lesson in Vengeance, which is coming out on August 3rd. And it's a sapphic dark academia, kind of like if Donna Tartt were lesbian and obsessed with ghosts. And finally, David. I'm so sold on that pitch. Like, <laughs> bring it on. Um, my name is David Levithan. Um, I and the other many books, um, the book that I have that is about to come out is a book that I wrote with Jennifer Nibben. It is called Take Me With You When You Go. And it is about two siblings, one who runs away. And my sibling Ezra is the one who is forced to stay behind and deal with the wreckage of his sister running away. So as you might be able to tell, we have a wide variety of sort of genres and formats and stuff like that. Uh, I wanna know what your favorite thing about the format or genre you chose to write in. So we've got like dark academia, we've got graphic novel, we've got historical, we've got like a co-written novel. Like what's your favorite thing about that particular medium that you don't think you could do in something else in another genre? I'll jump in. Um, first of all, I got to write about the eighties, which was a joy. Okay. Um, and I don't know if I would have had the opportunity or got to do that otherwise. Um, so in some ways it felt like writing my own origins, but in another sense, I also got to write what felt like kind of a superhero origin story, but for a queer nerd. And that was really fun to sort of get to approach a story with that type of structure in mind and that type of um, journey in mind. And I also tend to write a lot about in my own um, books that uh, um, about found families. And this was sort of the piece of what comes in a narrative before you get to that because the character is sort of coming into her own first and she has to sort of get to the point where she's this really um, empowered rebel loner <laughs> who's completely standing on her own before she then finds her her own people sort of later and I won't give away too much but for people who are still catching up with all of that big storyline <laughs> but it was very fun to get to explore a lot of those things yeah. Um, so I guess with Dark Academia, I was a big fan of the secret history always, but um, the queer content in there was more alluded to than like centered in the story. So I wanted to write like a queer version of that. And um, I feel that Dark Academia is a great genre in which to explore mental health issues. Um, I recently got my PhD in psychology and neuroscience. And so like, I am intimately familiar with how academia kind of demands passion from you, but passion can easily kind of turn into obsession and become really unhealthy and toxic. And then academia punishes you for being too passionate about the thing that they wanted you to be passionate and obsessive about. And so um, writing about that in dark academia with queer characters seemed like it would be a lot of fun to me. I mean, um... I think for me, I mean, I love writing with other people because it brings out a story that you never ever would have discovered yourself. And and in this book it is the first epistolary collaboration I've ever done, strangely, because it is the most obvious collaborative form. Um, it's strange that it took me my like, eighth collaboration to do it. But Jennifer and I, again, we started out with my character, Ezra, who's gay and basically wakes up one morning and his parents are yelling at him being like, where is your sister? And 
I wrote the chapter and then it was um, Jennifer's turn. And I genuinely did not know where the sister was at all. And so basically she would email me back with sort of updates from B, her character, but I was trying to piece together what had happened from her emails while Ezra was trying to piece together what happened from the character's emails. So it was very much like living the character's confusion and mystery. Um, but the book is very much about finding yourself and finding your own identity. And it was interesting to be partnered with somebody in doing that with two different characters from the same family, trying to find their own voices. Uh, I'm trying to think of a really succinct way to describe the ways that <laughs> graphic storytelling is um, kind of a unique way to tell a story. Uh, I think the most distinct thing for me in terms of writing a graphic novel and drawing a graphic novel versus a prose work is that I got to explore the imaginations of each of the characters. And so not only did I have to do a lot of very specific research about, you know, like I got to dive into old family photos and look at what we wore in the 90s. And I got to look at um, what people um, kind of thought of uh, as popular culture in the 80s. But then I also needed to do research on what clothing looked like in 1950s Vietnam and sort of dive into the sartorial history of the national dress in Vietnam as well. And so there's a lot of like kind of really specific visual research in terms of grounding the story in the real spaces where the story takes place. And so um, in the course of the characters doing a bit of storytelling and reading fairy tales to each other, I also got to dissect what each character's visual imaginations looked like depending on what context they come from. And so the protagonist is a young boy in middle school who, you know, grew up mostly in the United States. And so I got to look at why princess dresses look the way that they do in the Western popular imagination and how we came about um, figuring out how to express that in the sort of like Disneyfied popular culture way that we do um, and all of its roots in being kind of like this explosive mid-century um, uh, uh, couture invention that really sort of harkened back to the sort of extravagance after so much austerity during the world wars. Um, and then uh, going from that and then dissecting what would the imagination of, you know, a woman who uh, lived in Vietnam before the wars, like what would her visual imagination look like? How would she envision a fairy tale? And so it sort of gives you an opportunity to radically explore um, and empathize with characters in a way that's much more direct and um, kind of frank and blunt uh, in ways that can really only be alluded to in a, in a prose format. And so I really enjoy that about graphic novels. Awesome. Um, so of course, this panel is hooray for gay YA. So um, one of the things I was curious about is, is there any uh, media so it can be books or it can be TV or movies that was very like groundbreaking to you in terms of just like seeing a queer character, um, even if it's not someone that maybe aligns with like how you identify, um, like the first thing that you really remember seeing and being like, oh, oh, awesome, amazing. Okay, let's do more of that. I mean, for me, I mean, there are loads of sources. I could talk about like David Levitt's novels or Francis Scalia Block's. Um, but I think when I, just as influential for me was basically when I graduated college and when I first moved to New York City, it pretty much coincided with this wave of queer cinema that mostly was about like gay British boys finding love. There was this movie, Beautiful Thing, which is still one of my favorite movies, um, Get Real. Um, Edge of Seventeen, which was American, and just suddenly I had gone from seeing no representation whatsoever of queer youth to suddenly I was able to go to the Quad Cinema in New York and almost like every week there was a different queer movie that was playing and that really resonated with me. And looking back now, they are still very much creatures of the 90s and that there's always like a dose of tragedy and a dose of the sadness. There weren't any like truly purely happy stories, but it was part of the progression to go from the tragedies to the much more complex portrayals that we have now in YA. So I think that for me was a step that I couldn't find it in literature at that moment. So I found it on the screen instead. I'm a younger millennial. So I kind of feel like um, I went from in my childhood, like not being able to find any queer books to now there being like so many queer YA books like it's just like you can find almost any rep that you want right and it's usually super well done 
But one of the first queer books that I remember discovering was this copy of Annie on My Mind by Nancy Garden in the library. And this book was published in like 1982. So it had been out for a, a while, but like, I just, I think that my parents had no idea what it was because otherwise they would have taken it from me. But I brought that home and read it. And it was the first time that I was like, wait, this makes sense to me. Like, this is something that resonates with me. I didn't know this was allowed because I grew up in a su super religious conservative environment. Like I, that just didn't exist in like my realm of possibilities at the time. Um, but then as I was growing up, like the movie Rent came out and um, that was also like, oh, okay, cool. Like there's queer people everywhere. Like New York became in my mind, then like the center of the queer universe. And I recently got to move here. So I feel like I've achieved my childhood dream of being in like gay New York. Um, but yeah, now these days, like there's, there's so many queer way books. I wouldn't even know where to start. Like they're all amazing. Uh, okay, um, I'll, I'll go first then. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, I think my, in terms of my expectations about what I could expect from literature and from media, um, like I, I come at media as a, as a refugee, as an immigrant. And so kind of growing up, I had no expectation whatsoever to be able to see myself reflected in media in any sort of way. I sort of kind of got used to the, the notion that like I would have to extend a certain amount of empathy to fictional characters because they're necessarily going to be um, operating outside of the ken of my experiences. And that's kind of how I've always experienced media. And, um, you know, if you're a person of color and you're an immigrant and you're navigating queer media even today, like there's still a large um, tension between like your own experience and you kind of have to make a lot of empathetic leaps in order to make, sh make like facilitate that feeling alienation over something that's ostensibly for you. Um, and so it, I don't think that there has ever been a moment, like there's never really been like a queer character in any media where I've been like, oh, like this is the thing for me. But I will say that the story that's kind of stuck with me throughout my entire life for evolving reasons was Hans Christian Andersen's iteration of The Little Mermaid. It's a story that I've been obsessed with ever since I was really little and my parents really took to it because it's a story that's necessary, necessarily about transition. You move from one space to another, you give up your tongue, you give up your agency in order to be someplace that you love and to be with the people that you love. And so that was something that kind of really resonated with me as an immigrant. And then sort of growing up, um, kind of putting that within the context of the author as someone who was really trying to write a love letter to a man who did not return his feelings as being sort of like this, uh, this sort of like queer confessional story that he published like as a contemporary author in the 1800s. That was something that I found like, oh, like the ways that we express ourselves and the ways that we identify ourselves and where we place ourselves in stories like really can matter and can really be a, a wonderful outlet for us to express things um, that are complicated and nuanced and painful. So it wasn't so much like a queer character that ever spoke to me. It was sort of identifying that people have struggled and come up with really inventive and beautiful ways to express their queerness throughout the whole of history. And we've always been here um, in whatever forms that we've had. So that has always been very encouraging to me as um, a queer consumer of media and, a, and someone who is a queer creator as well. I think um, for me, I'd, I'd experienced I'd found some stories that had some queer content in them and, th and that was important to me and that was definitely formative for me. But the moment that really changed my idea of possibility in terms of, of stories and in terms of, um, and in terms of just that, that, that sheer thrill um, of seeing queer people uh, inhabit all spaces was starting to find fantasy and sci-fi that had queer characters in it. I just, those were my genres growing up. And the idea that queer characters could only exist in very, very certain prescribed sorts of narratives, I don't think that always existed. I think there were always places um, where, where our stories were being told and where, where queer people have always been telling our stories to each other, but the ones that were in mainstream media reaching me were were at that at the time that I was growing up still in these very, very specific molds. And some of them were beautiful and some of them were amazing. And I was, and I, and I really um, found myself engaging with things that I otherwise wouldn't. Like I read the Babysitter's Club when I was little and I it was the only non-fantasy thing I read. And I was like, why do I like this? Why do I like this so much? And I'm like, now I know why I like it so much. 
which is cool. I like that it can draw me to other things and can create affinities in these ways and help you, you know, step outside of, you know, um, your, your, your zone in a way. But I also just, the moment when I found, you know, Melinda Lowe's books, Alex London's books, Sarah McCary's early books, which were these sort of like myth punk books, God, please, like they're, they're, they're these, these backlist wrecks that I have to put out there, please go find Sarah McCary's old books. Um, they, I, and these, you know, were maybe only coming out 10, 15 years ago, but they were like completely changing things for me. I remember I was very lucky to meet Melinda Lowe shortly after I read Ash and sit at a table with her and 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 at, at, a, at a dinner and I was just sitting there looking at her being like, how did you do it? How did you get to do it? Did you, and the questions just started to spill out of my actual mouth at some point because I didn't know how you got to actually um, have queer characters in fantasy worlds, which makes no sense because fantasy is all about possibility and it's all about um, anything you can imagine. So why wouldn't we be imagining queer characters into those spaces? So once, once I saw that, all paradigm shifted in my head <laughs> and I was ready to, to just reclaim everything. Okay, so now comes we come to our portion of the panel where I have pan, uh, questions that are based on everyone's book. Um, so I'm gonna start with uh, August and so everybody can answer this. Um, Rebel Robin is obviously Stranger Things. So is there a dream uh, IP that you would love to write or is there a like movie or film or something else where you just want to read a book about those characters even if you're not the one who writes it? Um, I think I might have said this at some point before but um, Wednesday Adams just gonna keep putting it out there. <laughs> Wednesday Adams it's a big deal for me. Um, that character that you connect to so much when you're a kid. I think I was Wednesday Adams for four Halloweens in a row. So I'm just gonna keep saying it. And um, I, yeah, I, I love that very much. I also just wanted to quickly say that I keep putting this up. And the first time I put it up was like when David was speaking for the first time. And I, I swear, I did not put, this is just my coffee. And I, just in case anyone had picked up on what is on my mug, I just wanted to say it. <laughs> you know but I do need the coffee so I'm sorry David okay if you want each of to, to answer um again I I mean a good argument could be made that most of my career I've been basically writing my so-called life fan fiction but just varying it a little bit so and I wouldn't want to do official like I I, I feel the, the great thing about my so-called life is that it's perfect it was one season it was perfect I would never want to mess with it um so I, I will leave that alone but I think that is that is the inspiration and like in a totally different way like a bunch of friends and I so want to write an X-Men series like we just like absolutely there's nothing more queer than the X-Men and like we're like we want a full queer YA and middle grade like writing staff and to get a shot at the X-Men. So I'm putting that out. I would like to invite yeah. myself onto yeah, that I mean, team. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I am so intensely obsessed with the X-Men and I yeah. always have been. And if I could write like in any IP ever, I would want to write Magneto. Like mm -hmm. I just, like if anyone from Marvel ever encounters this, like even 20 years from now on the internet, I still, I guarantee you, I still want to write Magneto. <laughs> Uh, I think I have another, <laughs> I apologize. I feel like I'm, I'm giving non-answers to this all of the time. Um, but I, uh, I realized recently, I was asked a question at a different panel, like who my favorite fictional character is. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really care about fictional characters outside of the context of the stories in which they're presented. <laughs> and I don't know if that's just a habit of my, like I, I like to set boundaries around my imagination because it feels like a violation if I like, you know, I, I've never enjoyed the idea of playing in someone else's sandbox. However, I've sort of evolved on that a little bit. And as I kind of get my storytelling chops a little bit more refined, I'm thinking about like, huh, like within comics, I would love to tell like a Wonder Woman story <laughs> because she has so many different iterations over the years and there are things that have been retconned. But the thing that I find to be really fascinating is that she's consistently, like she started off as a nurse in her like secret identity and then she became uh, a museum curator so she's a historian of some of some some sort and so I 
am kind of fascinated by the idea of like, how do you feel about curation? How do you feel about repatriation? Like if you're, um, if you, the culture that you ostensibly come from in antiquity also exists concurrently outside of the, the bounds of the world, like what do you, like as a character, like how would you contend with that in a contemporary academic setting? And so that would be something that I wanna tackle. Okay, we're gonna to move to my A Lesson in Vengeance question, um, which is you have been sort of accepted and brought into this school that's very like, think like old sort of gothic -y school, a little bit falling apart in some sections, but we don't really talk about that. Uh, and when they bring you in, they are like, okay, so what are you studying? And you get the option of one subject and it can be a real subject or it can be like a magical subject, whatever you want, what would you wanna study? Um, I have always thought that if I went to like some kind of, especially like a magical school, I would really wanna study the theory of magic. Cause like when I was reading like magic books, especially magic school books growing up, the question that I always had was like, okay, but how does the magic work? Like, what are the rules on it? What are the boundaries? Like, like if you can use a wand and conjure like this little thing, like how, like, are you like literally drawing atoms out of the air? Like, is it just being like portaled in from an alternate dimension? Like, how is this now appearing? And so I would love to study like thaumatology or whatever it is, just like the mechanics and the philosophy behind why magic works the way it works in this like universe that I'm in. Um, I would want to study portals, thresholds, and liminal spaces with a minor in Shirley Jackson. <laughs> Just Shirley Jackson. <laughs> I, I early in my reading of like of adult books, I became obsessed with this book called The House of Sleep by Jonathan Coe about sleep researchers and like sleep scientists. And so I'm just gonna say that it would be fascinating to me to like really focus on sleep and and focus on that as both a power and like what happens when you're asleep and like the intersection of magic and sleep. I'd be very, that that would be what my concentrate, my thesis would be on that. Um, I'm not, not trying to interrupt anybody exactly. I just am taking a long time to come up with my answers because I've never thought about this before. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, off the top of my head, I, I like lore a lot, so I think I would like to like study uh, some kind of like magical history. I would want to know like how um, uh, how magic would influence the course of history and like what the particulars of um, power and politics look like within the context of like magic in an academic or like any kind of institutional setting because obviously there are going to be a lot of rules i want to know where they come from i want to know who um did the thing that made this rule a requisite like i i would i would want to know more in terms of um how the world is built um and its relationship to the people who navigate it okay uh so tron we're gonna do a magic based question which technically you won't be able to answer because it's in your book but i do need your visual aid because you have the book right by you right so for those who have not read magic fish yet um Trung uses color in this really amazing way would you be able to just show the three different the yellow and the blue and the red sure let me find some examples of each of those pages it's really, really stunning. Um, I'm gonna ask the question while you're thinking about that, if your main character um, had a color associated with them, like if they were a graphic novel and they had one color that was like their main thing, like what color do you think that they would be? Um, I think it would be orange. And I don't particularly love the color orange um, or anything. I don't have a special relationship to it, but I think the protagonist, Tian, um, would probably like the color orange. I have a feeling that he would enjoy all of the kind of summery citrusy things that kind of come with that color. And he would probably enjoy like a, a sherbet sunset. Um, so I imagine that he would like, he would like orange. Um, so the color schemes are, so this is a pretty good example of all of the different colors present at once. So the story takes place within a couple of different uh, story universes. And so yellow is um, an indication to the reader that the story is taking place in the past. This kind of like rosy red color is the story taking place in the present. And this blue color is the story kind of taking place within this, uh, the fairy tale universe. That's super cool. I just wanted to say that. 
Thank you. Um, I guess if my protagonist was a color, I think Felicity would be this like dusty lavender. Um, I'm not really sure why, maybe it's because she always seems like she has soft edges to me. And like, there's something mysterious about lavender. Like it's not quite purple, not quite blue, right? Like it's somewhere a little bit in between. It's got like a grayish tinge to it too. There's like just more than meets the eye to it. And I think the Ellis, the other main character would be like a milky gray. David? Yeah, I mean, it, what's funny is my, my answer is a combination of Victoria's answers and that I was thinking about my character and I'm like the king of like putting on something and then walking outside and discovering it's not the color that I thought it was when I put it on. So I feel Ezra is like, you have to look really closely to figure out whether it's a gray or a dark purple. Like I think he, he is both at once and it depends on who's looking and, and what the light is, whether you see it as purple or whether you see it as gray. Um, I think Robin is a really bright red. And it's really interesting because Stranger Things is told in this very dark, murky, lurky color palette. And for the most part, and there are some brighter scenes. And then like a lot of times we think of the eighties and we think of very specific sort of like neon or tur like magenta and turquoise and all of these colors and fuchsia colors. And I think that Robin just cuts across all of that with this really bright, strong, rebellious red. And that's how I saw her sort of from the beginning. And then the cover showed up and it was just bright red and blue. And I was like, yes, okay. We're seeing the same thing. That's, that's exciting. Okay. And so for David's book, um, obviously you're co-writing this. And so instead of asking who would you, your dream co-writer be, we're going to talk about just collaboration in general. Um, so what's one of your favorite things in your current book or your upcoming book that came about through collaboration, whether it was with your cover designer, your editor, your, um, your publicist came up with a really clever like tagline thing. Like what was sort of a favorite thing that has come about because of another person with your book? I mean, I will, I will certainly say in a very vague, very spoiler free, free way, because when, if you're reading the book, you'll get to it and you'll see what I'm talking about. There is a moment where Jennifer completely pulled the rug out from under me, which again, I never had a co-writer pull out the rug so significantly from me. Um, basically, whenever I always write back and forth with another writer, and so usually there's like a challenge or there's something you have to do when you read the end of their chapter and then you start, you're like, oh, okay, I have to do this. But she actually set up something that I was like, what the heck is this? Like, and that, those were not my exact words. They were much more colorful. Um, and I like spent about five minutes just being like, I can't do the, what? I, no, I need to do over, I can't do it. And then like, it occurred to me how to answer and then I just ran with it. And, and again, you will, if you, when you hit the chapter where it's my character clearly just running with it, that is me in response to, to Jennifer basically throwing down this crazy gauntlet um, and me having to rise to the occasion. And that's, again, one of the things I love about collaboration is the story would have taken a completely, the whole book would have taken a very different direction had she not made this one choice to basically up the stakes considerably for my character without my character knowing that it was coming. Uh, since I've been doing a lot of work in comics, um, I've gotten the opportunity to co collaborate in a lot of very particular ways. And so I'll often, I'll work with writers um, and some of my favorite writers to work with have been Alex DeCampi and Marguerite Bennett. Um, and I recently did uh, a short Aquaman comic with Marguerite Bennett um, for their uh, Aquaman's 80th. Uh, anniversary and so it's kind of a fun story set in the bombshells universe but that was a really lovely collaboration because I tend not to I like to do everything myself um, but when you're working on a superhero comic for a major publisher there is sort of like an assembly line process where you go through there's typically a, a penciler an inker a colorist and a letterer and that all comes after the writing and editing is complete 
And so there's a bit of a back and forth about how the, you know, the physical space taken up by the words will exist on the page because in a comic book, the, like the, the words and the text are both the text. And so there's a certain kind of orthography that you kind of have to navigate through. And so there's this dynamic process in collaborating with the reader as well, where everyone is sort of sussing out how the storytelling is being told visually. And so you sort of have to learn as you go how to read and make sense of the story for every single comic, it's a little bit different. And so I think that the kind of spirit of cooperation is always a little bit present if you're reading something with a lot of kind of disparate storytelling elements to it. And I think comics is a really nice example of being able to do that in a really elegant way. Um, I come from a theater background, a dramatic writing background. And so collaborative writing feels really, um, comfy and homey to me. <laughs> and I, I like doing it very much um, in lots of different ways. Um, I co-write some books with my spouse um, and Re Rebel Robin is obviously a big collaboration. So I, there was this great sort of workshopping phase of story back and forth with my editor and with um, the Stranger Things team. And then I got to go off and tell the story myself, which feels a lot like um, I was talking to Tess Sharp who also um, writes some IP projects and is this great, Queer author and I and we were talking about we both have these acting backgrounds and it feels a lot like acting it feels a lot like um, just embodied character um, and that's and that's a delightful thing to get to channel sometimes but the coolest thing that came from this collaboration was that after I handed the book in I thought that was fun and that was great and that was it and now that's and that's wrapped and then Netflix took it back and said this is so fun let's create another story around this and we're going to make a podcast that's going to release at the same time as the book. And it's gonna be based, they took a thread from the story that, I, that I'd come up with for, for Robin, one of the um, several threads in the book, and they expanded that into its own um, story and created scenes and wrote scripts around it. And so it's gonna be a six episode podcast that comes out, it's out now at the same time as the book. And, um, and Maya Hawk is, is going to, be there, you know, playing her role in the podcast and, and they got Sean Mayer to play this teacher, teacher character that I wrote. And so it's going to be like this great narrative nerdy extension of this thing that started with the TV show. And then I got to write the book and then we, we turn, you know, it just keeps taking these creative turns um, where we all build on the last thing, which is, which is very fun. And, and, and that bit was really unexpected. So I have not co-written a book that's been traditionally published, but I used to co-write a lot of fan fiction. Um, and that for me, like, it felt collaborative, not just because, you know, I had a co-writer, but because it was a transformative work of an existing canon, right? And so you were taking somebody else's world, somebody else's characters, and then you were making them your own. And in my case, it was typically taking them and making them queer. Um, I actually wrote a piece for Tor.com once about how writing Harry Potter fan fiction made me realize I was transgender, um, which is true. And of course, that's like a whole thing now because JK Rowling has kind of come out as being a huge transphobe. But I do think that like through the process of collaboration and transforming works, um, you discover like other layers to them, layers that make them more relevant to you, that make them more relevant to people that maybe wouldn't have resonated as much with the original content. And even now, like, I think I think about that a lot when I'm writing my own work too. I think about if somebody were to transform this work, if I were to have a collaborator in the future, somebody writing fan fiction about it, somebody role-playing within this universe, like what would they change about it? Or like what stories are hinted at in the narrative or possible within the narrative that aren't explicitly on the page. And I think that's a really cool dialogue to be having. And uh, I would love to in the future co-write a book with somebody just because I would love to get back into that experience too of like trying to find like the story that speaks to two people, the story that, I don't know, sometimes it can be like much more textured and nuanced than a story that you write yourself because you have somebody else's experiences and somebody else's background and mind influencing the way that you construct the characters in the world and the, the plot itself. That's beautiful. And that piece that you wrote um, is stunning and anyone who has not read it yet should go read it um, because incredible. 
Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So um, are there any uh, recent books or things that you've recently read that you've loved? They can be queer books, they can be any book you want, um, but anything that you've read recently and loved and want everyone else to pick up. Yes, um, always. So oh no, go. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard. You go first. Sorry, I just talked. Your turn. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's hard. Okay. Um, just a few quick things, things that I've loved recently. Um, uh, Victory is Greater Than Death by Charlie Jane Anders. So much fun. This, this delightful space opera. Um, uh, the Scape Gracers by Hannah Abigail Clark. So witchy, so good. Um, Moon Cakes by Wendy Shu. It's just lovely and sweet and fun and I love it. Um, and The Weight of Our Stars by Kay Ingram. Um, I will never stop wrecking this book. I think it's so beautiful. Um, and one more that I wanted to throw out there, which is not YA, but I think is super crossovery and 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 wonderful, is The Unspoken Name by A.K. Larkwood, which is just this like big, super imaginative fantasy creation. And I, I won't spoil too much by saying it's got a great romance in there, but it's, it's got a great romance in there. So <laughs> should check it out. Um, I would say for me, Legendborn is a big one that I read recently that I was obsessed with. It kind of has like dark academia vibes to it. Um, it's a, and it's set at my alma mater, UNC Chapel Hill. So I, I have to love it. Um, I would also say with NYA, Grown by Tiffany D. Jackson is one of the first books that's ever made me cry. Uh, that book was just, it's beautifully constructed. It's also tragic and has trigger warnings. So be sure to look those up. Um, also Riot Baby by Tochi Anyabuchi, which kind of exists in this crossover space. And then with an adult, The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed, which is based on Hungarian Jewish folklore. It's a fantasy, it's fantastic. And also The Space Between Worlds by Micaiah Johnson, which is like a kind of like sci-fi, super character driven, highly recommend. Um. I uh, recently recommended and still continue to recommend Displacement by Kiku Hughes. It's a graphic novel about um, kind of going back over the history of Japanese American internment and it's really beautifully written and told and drawn. Um, I also am starting, my TBR list is so long, but Aidan Thomas's um, Cemetery Boys is really, really good so far. <laughs> and I'm really excited to see how that story turns out. Um, I'm only about a third of the way through and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and then uh, both uh, Dear Martin and uh, Dear Justice by Nick Stone are excellent, excellent reads. I'm like feverishly taking notes as you guys make your recommendations. So thanks, thanks for making my TBR pile even bigger. Um, so I know that's how we do it, right? Um, I could go on forever with this question, but I will, I will limit it down to three. Um, I just read Can't Take That Away by Steven Salvatore, which blew me away, like a really fun, so loving genderqueer YA novel. Um, just amazing. Again, I like to think the spirit of my so-called life is within it, um, but just really special. Um, coming up, I will shamelessly plug Jay Coles's um, Things We Couldn't Say, which is coming out this fall, which I edited, which is an extraordinary book about a bi I would say a black bi boy um, grappling with his mother's sudden return after seven years and his first real relationship. It's phenomenal. Um, and then the book I've been evangelical about the most in the past two years, um, and I have gotten copies for so many friends, um, is The Vanished Birds by Simon Jimenez, which is an adult Specific novel, which is not usually the thing that I read, and it just blew me away. And truly, every single person that I've given a copy to has like gotten back to me and been like, "Oh my God, thank God! I would not have known about this book otherwise. This is amazing." Um, whether you are into sci-fi or specific or not, like it just just grabs you and is just amazing. And I have no idea who Simon Jimenez is. I I'm sure if I ever met him, I would fanboy way too much, but it's just the kind of book that, again, when you read it, you just want everybody you know to read it. Okay, um, if you could give one piece of advice to the you who was just starting out writing, what would you tell them? I know that's, I should have given you that question in advance because you're probably gonna have to think about it, 
but like is there something that you would say to them if you could send them a little piece a nugget of knowledge that you've got now i mean i think i think for me at the risk of sounding like i am the 100 year old man on this panel but i, I think at first like it's funny um, when August was talking about Melinda Lowe, like Melinda and I just had a conversation about being the old guard, even though we've been doing this like a decade or 15 years or even 20, but it's true. And I would say at the start, I mean, like it was strange being one of the only ones. I mean, and just, we were saying it would have blown our minds to know for me, like in 2003, when Boy Meets Boy came on and basically whenever I did a, a queer YA panel, it was the same four or five of us every single time for a couple of years. Um, especially if it was queer authors of queer YA. And it would have blown our minds to Victoria's early point to know that here in 2021, there are literally hundreds of amazing queer YA books and queer YA authors. Just that it could grow so exponentially in 18 years. Again, I think, I would like to think that my my debut younger self would have seen that coming and been like, yes, one day we'll get there. But I think he still would have been amazed to know, again, not just numerically how many there are, but the quality of it and also the diversity within the queer spectrum and the intersectionalities that are being represented in 2021 that truly was what we were dreaming about in 2003. Um, kind of building off that, I guess I would tell my younger self to write the story that you want to read. Um, I think starting out, just speaking for myself here, right, like you think you have to write this great like literary masterpiece and it has to be like of literary merit, like whatever that means. Um, and often, at least in my head at the time, that meant heterosexual um, and kind of boring. So I think that like when I started writing books and not worrying about like, oh, does this seem too fanficy? Um, my writing improved a lot and I started enjoying myself more. And specifically that also meant like writing more queer books. Like uh, my debut, The Fever King, when I wrote it, um, it is queer. Every character in the book is queer. And my critique partner confronted me about that and said, don't you think that like you'll have a hard time getting this published because everyone's gay? Like that's just not realistic. It kind of just reads like fan fiction. And I remember thinking like, well, I love to read fan fiction and I'm sure that a lot of other people also love to read fan fiction. So if having queer characters in it makes it read like fan fiction, that only sounds like a compliment to me. Um, and it did end up getting published. And the fact that everyone in it is gay is one of the things that a lot of my readers say is one of their favorite parts of the book. So I just wish that I had knew, known when I was younger that I should write what I want to read and what I want to write and not really care about whether or not it was gonna fit into some like imaginary literary canon I invented in my head. Uh, I think I kind of have similar sentiments to that. I wish, like I've only been doing this for a few years, but I think that one of the things that um, kind of maybe newer writers and creators get into is like there's this sense of preciousness about how we make our work. And especially for, um, like if you come from a marginalized background of any variety, there is this sense that like, okay, so you're given space to tell the story and there's like not a whole lot of personnel from your background in these industries to begin with. And so you're like, oh no, do I have some kind of special responsibility to tell stories that will edify the public? And you, you don't, you, you get to tell the stories that you want to read. You get to tell whatever stories that you want. Um, and I think that would have been a lot more liberating because then I, you know, I would have been a little bit more free and a little bit more, um, a little less nervous. Like I probably would have written the same story, but I probably wouldn't have been so fraught um, in my relationship with it. So that's that's always something to um, that that would have helped me kind of get the story onto the page is to stop worrying so much about getting every single detail right because you will tell more stories. Um. I, I would say to myself um, that you can't hide from your heart in your work. I knew that I was going to have to work hard and I had no fear of that. I wanted to work hard, but I a little bit wanted to hide myself in my work. And I went, when I was starting out, I really, I, I thought maybe if, if I worked really hard and I, and, I, and I 
put my stories together in, in, a, in a really strong way. And then maybe, maybe I wouldn't have to put my feelings in them. Maybe, maybe I could get away with not <laughs> doing that. And I don't think I, I thought that overtly, but um, it was scary, I think, to be vulnerable in that way um, and to be honest in that way. And it took me a while to feel like, and, and part of that was, part of that was 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 queerness and 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 ha and not having grown up feeling like that was something I could just naturally express all the time in all um you know and I, I was I was sort of towards the end of a of coming out the process of coming out when I was starting to write seriously so it wasn't necessarily that I wasn't used to putting it out there but it was more just about putting myself out there, putting, putting my heart out into the world <laughs> in this way that, that I think takes a lot of um, courage. And I would just say, you know, to myself and to other writers who need to hear this today, you have that courage. <laughs> so. Keep writing. Beautiful, beautiful sentiment to end on. Um, I just want to run down really quick. And if you've got uh, something that needs pre-ordering, from folks in the audience, um, if you can just tell us what it is and when it comes out, if you've got something that's just come out or has been out for a little bit um, that you want folks to get, just remind them, title, your name, where they can find you online, et cetera. Um, so August, since you're- <laughs> Since I've been <laughs> muted. Um, yes, Rebel Robin came out in June, uh, is out there, the podcast is out there, you can go find those now. Um, you can also pre-order my book, The Heartbreak Bakery, which comes out in October. Um, it is about an agender cupcake named Sid who accidentally uh, breaks up a bunch of people with a batch of magical brownies. Um, so that is that is available for pre-order right now. And that um, and you can find my work at onceinfuturestories.com, which is a website I share with my spouse, Corey McCarthy, who's also an author. David. Um, so yeah, so you can pre-order Take Me With You When You Go, um, which is out on August 31st. Um, so, and it is the first collaboration I've ever written where I come first alphabetically. It's a big achievement for me. So, um, so you can find it either under David Levithan or under Je Jennifer Niven. Victoria. So you can find my Savvy Dark Academia Lesson in Vengeance um, coming out August 3rd from Random House. Um, you can pre-order it on my website, victorialeewrites.com. You can also pre-order signed and personalized copies through Astoria Bookshop. And if you wanna read my previous work, the, the all gay fanfic -y ones, um, that's The Fever King, The Electric Air. And you can also find those on my website. And I'm on all social media, like uh, Twitter, Tumblr, TikTok, um, Instagram at so said Victoria. Oh, I had a moment of like, what did I make? What can I recommend? Um, uh, so uh, my book, The Magic Fish has been out since October. You can get it um, at your local bookstores. And I uh, also made a tarot deck called the Star Spinner deck um, that is also available everywhere at bookstores. You can find me on the internet at Trungles pretty much everywhere. And my website is trungles.com. Awesome, thank you all so much. And thank you so much to Random House and Underlined for uh, letting us, inviting us to this panel. I think it was super fun for all of us. So I hope everybody has a great day and make sure you pick up these amazing queer books. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>